So we have uh, Brian from Coda. Brian coming up. Uh, Brandon, sorry, sorry. Did I say Brian? That's all right. Uh, sorry, I'm excited. I'm excited to be here with you guys. Uh, you're, you, you guys want to make money from uh, test nets, so it's not even mainnet, and you guys want to make money, don't you? Um, Zaki from uh, Tendermint, come on stage. And uh, Ben from Storage. Uh, ben was uh, previously from Docker. Did you guys know that? Know that? And uh, Ilya from Near Protocol. Bravo. Yay, come on. <laughs> OK, thank you, thank you. I know it's uh, going to be lunch uh, pretty soon, but uh, hang on there. Um, so let's start with uh, an introduction. Um, uh, Ilya, why don't you uh, start with, uh, with you, a bit about yourself and the protocol? Sure, yeah. So my name is Ilya. Um, before kind of jumping into blockchain, I've been working for about 10 years in machine learning. So have a very different view. And I jumped in blockchain only 14 months ago, just for context. Uh, so a little bit different view from many other folks who are in blockchain for a while. Um, we are building what we really hope will be the most usable platform to build applications on. And not just in blockchain, but ideally kind of across the web as well. Um, and you know, to, to do that, we build a smart contract platform. We have sharding, we have all of the developer tooling, a bunch of other stuff, so check it out. All right, um, go ahead, Ben. Oh, thank you, so I'm, I'm Ben Golub. Uh, as, as you mentioned, I've, I've, I'm an outlier here. I'm, I'm older and shorter than everybody else on the, on the panel. <laughs> um, it's not a competition, but you win. I understand, yeah, yeah, so well, and part of the reason why I, I've shrunk so much is, is I'm now on my eighth startup, uh, fourth as CEO, <laughs> uh, and each one takes a little bit out it's of it. It's all the uh, suitcases of money above your head stacking up there, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly, that's it. Um, yeah, so um, uh, part of this, I was uh, CEO of Docker, uh, uh -huh. which is, you may know, one's the, biggest uh, open source projects, uh, part of that uh, CEO of Gluster, which was open source storage. We sold to Red Hat, uh, uh, Plaxo early, social networking companies sold to Comcast, and then ran a really large uh, payments and security business at VeriSign. Um, now I'm at storage, mm -hmm. um, which when I go home for Thanksgiving, I will describe to my relatives as Airbnb for disk drives. And then they'll ask me to fix their printer or something like that. <laughs> but um, you know, essentially, what we've set up is a large decentralized storage network. Uh, we're actually uh, we've been running uh, a live version of our network since 2017, which got to like 150 petabytes. We're now on the next version of our network, um, all on the same basically the main net, uh, um, with the difference that with the one that we're coming out with now, we are enterprise grade. So we're now not only about uh, a half to a third the price of Amazon Web Services, but are actually faster, 100% durable, um, and of course, all the security benefits of being uh, decentralized. All right, congratulations. Um, go ahead, Zaki. Um, Zaki, Tendermint Cosmos. Uh, before our blockchain, I've been doing blockchains for about five years. Um, I have been involved in a bunch of different projects. I sort of, uh, put together the Cosmos Hub mainnet launch uh, last year, um, which sort of was the first incentivized testnet, so this is why I'm on this panel. Um, got things wrong, uh, got things right, we're doing another one we're calling Game of Zones, um, I think, uh, so that's uh, me in a nutshell. All right, uh, last but not least, Brandon, go ahead. Hi, uh, I'm Brandon, I am head of product engineering at O of One Labs, and yeah, we're building Coda. Um, so uh, Coda is a layer one protocol that uses recursive ZK snarks to compress the blockchain down to a small constant size. Um, magic. Thank you. <laughs> and magic. Uh, yeah, it's, it's really cool. Um, so uh, yeah, and I, I've been uh, uh, recently spending most of my time uh, leading our testnet engineering efforts. So uh, I guess that's why I'm on this stage. All right, and how's that been working out for you? Uh, pretty well. Pretty well? Good, yeah. good, good. I come into their office and tell them they're doing it wrong. Zaki, Zaki helps us. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. It's a collaboration, right? You're not competitors. Um, you're all looking for uh, clients, I assume, right? Apps to build on you. So if you got you guys are app developers, uh, go ahead and talk with them. So um, we're here to talk about uh, incentivizing uh, um, uh, testnets, right? 
Um, so the first uh, question I have for you guys is um, we want to have a, a network to be uh, secure and uh, trustless and to prevent nodes from colluding with each other and not to be too homogeneous, right? Uh, there were projects that were all uh, spinning up Amazon web servers uh, inside their offices and uh, that's how they tested the testnet and that's uh, not, a, not a really real world uh, simulation, isn't it? Um, so part of that diversiveness, I'd say it's a geographical diversiveness because uh, people in different geographies are used to program in different way. They have their different languages and operating systems and the way they do things. Um, and you guys are all, you guys are all from the, U the US, right? All of you? I think we're all from Bay Area probably. Yeah. probably. Bay Area? All of proof of stake is pretty much centralized around uh, second admission. <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so, and so in that case, uh, I uh, have uh, news for you. There is another uh, world out there uh, outside of the Bay Area. I'm from Tel Aviv myself, um, and um, yeah. So, so you're all in the same geography. How do you get people from different geographies, different uh, backgrounds? You know, uh, heterogeneous uh, crowd. How do you do that? Okay. I mean, I can start. I mean, I think I spent probably three months out of this year not being here and pretty much being everywhere else. So that's a big part of it, is actually going to other communities and engaging with them. I think I definitely saw Zaki in every single place I went as well, and I probably traveled less than him. <laughs> um, <laughs> Disaster! It's like an ego. proof of stake is supposed to be like the green form of consensus, but like apparently <laughs> I have to license. fly everywhere <laughs> to decentralize it. So like it probably like mostly evens out at this point. <laughs> so yeah, but uh, the other part is actually just engaging with this community online, right? That that's a big part as well because and big part of it is you know ambassadors who can actually help you, who actually speaks the local language. Um, Part of it is actually having on your team some people who speak different languages. Helps a lot as well. Uh, so you can spread the message as well. Yeah, you um, got that in the Silicon Valley. That's a, yeah. that's a plus. Yeah. And then the other part is kind of investors, which if you have a diverse set of investors around the world, you actually can engage them to find their local um, kind of developers, validators, community that you can engage with as well. So yep. just using all the resources we have. Yeah, that's what we do uh, at Collider. I'm an investor myself, and we're based out of Tel Aviv, and this is, uh, yeah, this is definitely uh, interesting. Okay, uh, Ben, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, so um, we are a decentralized storage company in more ways than one. Um, of the 42 or so people who work for the company, we're in 11 different countries, 17 different cities. So I think it starts by having you know, your, your work. Well, you got a head start, uh, 2014, right? Uh, did, did get, yes, yeah, so I started uh, actually in a college dorm in Morehouse College in Atlanta, so we also didn't start out uh, in a typical way. Um, our, um, our network actually, though, uh, uh, as peak is like 125,000 different nodes operated in uh, 180 countries and territories. Um, so I think part of what we what we did, I mean, obviously we did a lot of the same sort of best practices of choosing community leads who are from around the world and making it easy to localize uh, the content. Um, but honestly, we, we jumped right into what sort of the equivalent of a mainnet would be, right? We, we sort of said the way, the way to get big and global is to sort of put on our big boy pants <laughs> or big girl pants and um, uh, set up incentives and, you know, be prepared for good behavior and bad behavior and Byzantine behavior, and that's actually a lot of how you learn. It's also how you get uh, sort of that geographic uh, dispersion. Mm -hmm. Okay, nice. Um, so, uh, Zaki, you want to take that? So, I think the gold standard in building a global community is the Ethereum community and basically the work that Vitalik did, which basically was like, puts all of our travel schedules to shame um, mm -hmm. and has been doing this for like basically five years. Um, yeah, I saw him in Israel in 2013. Uh, yeah, okay. so he's been doing that for a while. He's been doing it for a long time. Um, I think the other big component um, that was like a big part of uh, the Cosmos strategy was to make the community members that showed up feel like members and like that they were fully part of the team. Of, of, of the network. And so, you know, trying, we, we do a lot of work around trying to, you know, not have as much disparity between 
sort of external contributors and internal contributors, our validators and our developers. We try to treat them all kind of very similarly. We try to do everything in the open as pull requests and issues on GitHub. Uh, we try to make sure that everybody can contribute. Um, that is a little bit of the strategy. And honestly, as I think about this, you know, for a variety of reasons, everything about like the current way of thinking of doing this is completely unsustainable. Um, <laughs> ecologically, um, time-wise, destruction of personal lives, like all of these things. Uh, so I'm spending a lot of time right now thinking about like, how do you get to a global community without just like destroying yourself and the environment along the way? I don't think I have the answers yet though. VR? Maybe. Uh, um, well, time, time zones really suck. That's really the main problem. They do. Time, time zones. zones. Yeah. Time zones. yeah. The decision about to live on a sphere was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. The, the the only thing that I would maybe add to that, uh, I, I think we're doing a lot of a lot of the same things as others. But um, one thing that we're uh, doing that uh, maybe helps on the the green bit. Um, though, though maybe not as effective as being there in person, we're, we're having one-on-one -on -one video calls with a lot of our community members, especially the really engaged ones, and, and making them feel like they, uh, you know, have a voice, they can share their opinions, they can, um, you know, tell us what's broken, and, and, and that one-on-one, -on -one, well, or, you know, one of them and maybe a couple of us in a room on a call, uh, we, we've noticed has sort of retained some people. Uh, all right, I then could, uh, let me just say, I mean, I think one of the, I think the important points that you've heard uh, is that um, for a lot of the core members of your community, the people who are doing technical contributions, it's really a mistake to conflate incentives with motivation. And, um, you know, a well-run open source project, and, you know, coming from Docker, this was really important. We had like 3,000 contributors, a few thousand pull requests a week, right, was that you, you make people feel like they are, and you actually treat them as if they're part of your, your family, right? And then this is not about giving them a few, to uh, you know, a few tokens, right? This, this is about really valuing their contributions, giving them a level of control, and being willing to be decentralized in how you manage your code base in the same way that you manage your, uh, you know, your, your community. Yeah, give them responsibility also, I guess. Responsibilities and uh, then, yeah, let and you them have to be so become much employees, right, if they want. Yeah, yeah and you have to be selective about what it is that you do versus what is it that what spaces you create for what vacuums you purposely create for other people to fill. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and when, when, when you're in uh, testnet, uh, there you have this uh, evolving uh, code base, right? You have bugs and things are not stable. Uh, how do you manage retention of developers? How do you how do you keep them engaged? Um, anybody? I mean, yeah. like so, you know, I. Uh, Around last year this time, this is when we were getting ready to launch the Game of Stakes testnet. Um, and the code was not ready. Um, there was, we thought the code, we, we, as I think every project is learning, like how to QA your code and like how to know it's ready is almost a harder problem than writing it. <laughs> um, and so we were still, you know, figuring that out and like, um, and like we would stand up test nets and they would go down. We wa really wanted to get, you know, things launch ready. We had a schedule that we were trying to meet. Um, and we ended up inventing like what ended up being like a good enough QA mechanism um, just by like sort of trying a bunch of things, developing a bunch of tooling. Uh, we're very proud of our simulator um, that got us, uh, allows us to simulate the state machine. Um, and that all got us to this uh, point, but like, you know, I think I had people trying to start a test net on like Christmas Eve last <laughs> year, and uh, like, yeah, it was, it was kind of, a, you know, it was a nightmare. Uh, definitely not doing that again. I, we have a policy for this coming investment uh, by his test net. They're, they're, it's either gonna be ready by December 1st or we're doing it after next year. I mean, we're just starting, actually, our incentivized t test nets take wars on Monday, so I'll, I'll have more, right. more data in coming, coming weeks. But Expect to run into some brick walls. Yes, so, so we actually started with the premise that this is designed to be br bricked and like destroyed, crushed, burned, and fire. Um, and this is actually where incentives come in. Incentives come in from breaking it. 
Right. So like testing, bending, and breaking, that's kind of our uh, classification. And the idea is actually incentivize people to come in and build more tooling to test, build more kind of, or like just do different types of attacks on the system. And in a way, we actually maybe like trying to engage community to do QA with us. So we have our like test framework, which you know spins up nodes, drops them, destroys them, doing all those things. And the idea is like we can do only that much. There's a lot more ideas how to break it. People actually can go participate, get excited. Like at least from my perspective, it's exciting to go and break somebody else's code. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have any time doing that, but like in general, this is something that a lot of people would be excited about. And actually doing that by improving the final system, right? So that's how we like look at that. So part of your uh, game and incentives is to let people break things, and that's how you uh, manage retention. Yeah. Yep. Good, <laughs> good, good, good. No, makes sense. Uh, ben, you want to? Yeah, I mean, so again, what, what we did, which is somewhat different, is we didn't uh, have a separate testnet from a mainnet. I mean, in essence, we launched the mainnet, and then we had various phases where we were declaring the code to be beta and uh, declaring it to be live. And so we sort of followed, you can also sort of think of it as two phases. There's the first make sure that it isn't broken in ways that you can predict. Uh, and that was just sort of good coding practice, testing to make sure that things work technically. And there again, the motivation and the incentives that we set were for people who like to build great code. But then we thought it was important as quickly as possible to get live with uh, and test the things that you can't simulate, which is how are Byzantine actors going to behave and how are people going to try and uh, defraud the system, and uh, you know that was basically our V2 network. It got really big, uh, and we learned all sorts of interesting ways that people could could defraud the network. Um, and then we, while keeping the V2 network running and live, and it stayed live forever, we started building our V3 network, which was much more resistant to the kinds of you know games that we saw, right? Um, and now we've managed to, uh, you know, we're. Uh, uh, you know, uh, at a point where the V3 network is far larger, far more robust than the V2 network. Um, and because we're ERC20, we didn't change, you know, the basic, uh, uh, you know, underlying uh, incentive token, right? Yeah. Um, uh, Brandon, uh, how, how are you tackling retention? Yeah, so so our, our testnet um, is is early. Uh, it's It was very early when we started. Um, it So things were buggy and, you know, our, our uh, our code is, uh, or, or rather, like you know, doing the stuff that we're doing with Snarks is quite complex. So, um, so anyway, that is to say, there are bugs. So, so the, the <laughs> there are always bugs. <laughs> there are always bugs. The the thing that we can't control early are are some of the bugs, and especially because we we wanted to engage people early. But the thing that we we could control um, things like uh, really good documentation on day one, um, written so that it could be translated into other languages. Uh, the, um, I just had a brain blank. Uh, I had another good <laughs> <one>. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, Bravo. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Bravo. You'll, you'll, you'll come back no. to it. Don't worry. Uh, I got it. Okay. Written, <laughs> written docs on day one. And then, um, uh, we had a, a really easy to install, uh, package experience like you you didn't have to compile from source so we had brew install for you know mac users and an apt for debian and, and ubuntu and that uh you know people have told us that that's made it easy for them to get started and then you know if they only invest a little bit of time to get started if it breaks fast uh you know <laughs> they'll they're more likely to come back than if they spent a really long time to get started and then mm -hmm. yeah, uh, definitely yeah. and um Let's see. Um, th there is a dilemma that uh, when I when I thought about the questions for this uh, panel, um, on one side you want to keep things uh, fair and you want the, the the rules and the incentives to be to be equal for for everybody, right? It's a fair game and, and everybody can participate and the same entry ground, right? Um, but on the other hand, I think uh, different things motivate different people. Uh, we are all. Uh, individuals, as they said in uh, Monty Python, for those who are fans, um, and um, and so maybe you want to consider not having the same rules for for everyone in terms of incentives. Um, Brandon, do uh, do you have thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, so 
we we do so okay we, there's there, there's sort of two two facets to this um one is we we want to be transparent with how uh folks are rewarded and and in our in our networks we we have this concept called testnet points that we use to incentivize our users and testnet points do not have any sort of monetary value associated with them but we have this nice leaderboard on our website and and so uh you know people uh like to win, and and so so what what we do is we we come up with these challenges uh, for every one of our test nets, and and those sort of encourage behavior towards one specific aspect of our network that we want to um, test, and and uh, and and if if you do those challenges, you you get the points, and so it's in, in that sense it's very transparent and, and equal for everyone, in the sense of uh, you know then. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is like you, you have some some users that, that do things that you don't expect that are amazing. That, that like uh, one of our one of our contributors, uh, Gareth, um, made a block explorer uh, like an awesome one uh, in in his free time. And and so we we, we have allocated a, a certain amount of points that we give to like uh, MVP of the week, and and that's sort of how we um, award people in an, in an extra way. And those points are worthless. Do they know that? Um, so, so the, the the points the points are uh, Just important to have a number that goes up. Yes, the number goes up, and and <laughs> you know it, it's a signal to us and to the community that that uh, like if you have more points, then you are more engaged and you're helping the test net move forward, and and that um, you know that's a good signal for uh, for us and and for others if if you're going to run a node that maybe folks will delegate uh, to. Things like yeah. That. yeah, I guess, I mean, you saw that in GitHub, right? People have uh, more points, more commits, uh, and, right. and uh, <laughs> Stack Overflow. Uh, yeah, okay, cool. No, um, I think different people are motivated by different things, right? And, and it doesn't always have to be a, an economic incentive, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if people are interested in working on great code or building up their reputation uh, or getting the, you know, uh, adulation of their peers, right? You don't, you don't have to reward different people differently. You just have different motivations for different types of behavior, and the kind of motivations you want to have for helping you build your code base are very different than you know, running a node. And I, I think one of the reasons that we're able to attract uh, people when when there are these other opportunities that they are rewarded, uh, you know, monetarily, is is just because we have like this really cool tech that's different and unique, and and both from an operation perspective, like operators have a unique experience, and there's sort of this like you know the fact that the blockchain is constant uh, is crazy, so. I think one of the things, though, that is challenging right now is when I was doing this the first time, I was mostly operating in a setting with non-professional operators. Mm -hmm. um, it was it was bef you know it was before the professionalization of the space, and um, the the last year and the main, the network launches over 2019 um, and sort of the maturing of the Tezos ecosystem have sort of gotten us to the point where we have. We have largely professionalized a lot of the participants in, in these networks um, and to an increasing extent. Um, and so I do think that it makes crafting these systems quite a bit more challenging. I mean, on our side, like what we've tried to do, and like we've been struggling a lot with this idea that like different work, different type of contribution will be valued very differently. So we tried to kind of split it up into this, like, the amount of work that requires to like test versus really like, uh, you know, quote unquote bend uh, is different. So we try to kind of classify that at the end. But at the end, yeah, there still will be a kind of some human judgment, which uh, we will need to do on how, how much impact this did on the network, right? And, and we're just being very transparent about that, that this will be a human judgment at the end of like, but we kind of, this is the criteria we'll be judging on, you know, the impact on the network. If you build something, you know, how valuable that is long term. For example, somebody built, you know, Block Explorer or built, you know, a testing simulator, which, you know, uh, or found a bug, which, you know, actually would stall a network in production, right? This is way different than if you just ran a node installing from sudo app, you know, apt install, right? So, so this is kind of like just being transparent about these differences and, Kind of at least adding some like buckets which people can like orient themselves in. That that's at least our approach. Um, so Ilya, I have a question. Uh, Zaki mentions that um, uh, the space has become more professional. There are more professional uh, node runners. Node runners? That sounds. Uh, it was this movie right? I uh, like Blade Node Runner, runner better. <laughs> I like. I, it sounds like a. It does sound cool. Node it runner. does sound runner. definitely more cyber cyberpunk. Yeah. Uh, so 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 there is so there is that, and and so the first part of the question is is that uh, 
positive or negative thing. And the second part uh, is, um, uh, can you lower the bar for people to participate in testnet, even you know, not non-techy? Can it be a, a file that you double click uh, and it just runs a node on your computer? And that's all you need to know. So yeah, I mean, I think like, I've actually changed my opinion as I was engaging more with professional validators. Um, because kind of when I first saw like this professionalization, I was kind of disappointed because we kind of end up in the same state as we had with proof of work, where it's all just controlled by you know really three large mining pools, and you know if you need to front run something, you just go to them and you know pay them a million dollars. Like and, every time we say we want to democratize, democratize money, and then every yeah. time it consolidates again. Yeah. On the other side, like as I kind of engaged more with like what it takes to start these networks and actually run them securely, especially when you're securing, you know, like tens to hundreds of millions of dollars, like each validator, that is, you know, gets to a point where you can see value in like a professional company that is doing this full time and actually, you know, knows about code, knows, like, and can make very educated decisions because at the end validators end up uh, also doing a lot of kind of technical <coughs> governance work where they actually decide what's gonna be upgraded because they actually run into code. So that's one side, and and I think like longer term, right? Uh, we'll like what we trying to encourage is actually balance, where you have professional validators, which will have like kind of larger allocation because of delegation, because of their reputation, and then have a way to have a long tail of kind of smaller individual validators that maybe double clicked and downloaded a thing, or maybe it's actually like a developer and running a node to you know power their application. So that's the idea is like. Like the way we kind of trying to elect is uh, to unlock this long tail of validators, <coughs> um, and yeah, for sure we should, we need to make this stuff easier. There is, I mean, Zakil has I think a point that like making it too easy might be at least at this point very dangerous, and uh, like I can see that um, just because right now, for example, if you don't have your keys in in some kind of secure hardware or at least SGX. You know, if somebody breaks in, they can steal your money. This is huge, uh, or like double sign, you get slashed. It's you know creates huge risk on just people turning around and saying like, oh, I don't want to run this, and kind of creating a huge massive like splash in PR. And that's uh, so there is a double-sided thing of like having lots of non-professional validators who might not be caring about security as much. Um, yeah, so we actually, you know, we thought it was really important in designing a storage network to, to not have uh, uh, it be very difficult to run a node. Um, now, we took a very different set of problems, and, and partially some of our solutions were saying, hey, we don't want to use blockchain to solve some of our problems. Like, for us, the biggest thing that we want for people who are running nodes is to have a good connection to the internet, to always be up, and to make sure that they are storing what they claim they do, right? So for understanding whether people are up or not, we just use good peer-to-peer -peer technology and are constantly pinging to make sure that people are up, to make sure that they are storing what they claim they do. We do a cryptographic challenge, but it's a cryptographic challenge that is computationally very cheap if you're doing the right thing, mm -hmm. right? Basically, you know, hey, give us, uh, give us a hash of the following parts of the file that you're saying you're, you're storing, and it's really easy to do it if you're doing the right thing and really hard to do if you're not, right? And so that has sort of allowed us to thread the needle where we want to be, you know, half to a third the price of uh, AWS and yet at the same time give people who are running the underlying nodes enough profit incentives to stick around. And we've managed to do that, but that means we have to make it profitable to run a node, you know, and earn, you know, five to ten dollars a month as opposed to something far more significant. Um, all I would say is, in general, like, the economy of, you know, all of, of, of all of these systems is, is there's like a lot of fragile points to it right now. Um, there is the possible, like, I'm, I strongly suspect that running infrastructure and networks is not by itself a business, um, that it is probably an, uh, uh, um, uh, a side business or an, a aligned business with many other sort of core businesses, but what are those core businesses is still being figured out. Um, and, you know, the biggest danger is what we've seen in EOS where essentially exchanges run your network. It's a network that like serves exchanges, is run by exchanges, uh, <laughs> serves no, like this is what it has become. Um, 
And I think that's a easily, uh, easy pathology to like fall into um, as a network. Um, and so I think that there's a lot of figuring out. There's also like the general problem that all the proof of stake networks are too small right now to pay a large number of node, op node operators, um, which could you know, uh, easily lead to like a flight from quality and a market for lemons. Um, sort of a, it's, there's a lot of Im information asymmetry in this market. Like one of the, one of the businesses that I thought of starting before I kind of got fully sucked into like actually just like moving Tendermint forward and Cosmos forward was like, uh, uh, you know, proof of stake operator sort of rating certification business. Uh, but now I'm too deeply conflicted in, <laughs> to like start that business, but I would love it if someone would start like and execute on that business. Well, it would really help. Um, I, sorry, just just to respond to that, there there is a, so I I, I was at a Tezos conference uh, recently and um, one of a Twitter account followed me baking bad and I think they they do this sort of <laughs> yeah there's like a couple of emergent Twitter. ones but like no one has really I think fully like gotten product market fit there right got it um, yeah and so so to touch on the the, the bit about the double click experience mm -hmm. um, we so. Yeah, so so we we uh, think that is really important, and 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 it's it's important because you know not everyone uh, can can use the CLI, and and and, uh, and and we don't want to exclude people who would otherwise be operators of the network, even people who would want to participate in consensus. So so we're we're working on a first party like graphical user interface uh, uh, application for for operators, um, and and we're we're working towards that like double click experience for for the reasons that. You know, All we've right. talked about. Um, so uh, I want to talk about uh, costs. Um, on the one side, uh, uh, Zaki, again, you're, you're giving good examples. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that um, uh, projects don't have enough uh, money to pay uh, node operators a lot of times. Um, and so I want to know what are the uh, costs of uh, running the node, both like the setup and uh, the ongoing costs of, of running it, I don't know, in manpower and electricity, if you can make some kind of an ex uh, assumption. And um, what are the ways to minimize those costs? Uh, Zaki, do you want to start? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I also have a, a sort of node operating business called Occlusion uh, that I run. Uh, we run nodes primarily on the Cosmos main net and the, uh, the Cosmos Hub mainnet and the Terra mainnet, um, but we are also participating in a number of test nets. We have been helping out with a number of other projects. So I have a fairly comprehensive understanding of like what your cost structure is to be one of these operators, um, at least if you are, you know, uh, if the network requires less casual operators, like, um, like Coda is specifically designed for like sort of a more casual operator and a lot of the, some parts of the occlusion setup are perhaps overkill though for like the snark worker stuff, um, maybe it'll be okay. So anyways, um, what I would say is that like as a practical matter, um, our server and data center costs were not insignificant but like are a small fraction of the salaries you need to pay to, for, to have a number of full-time people uh, looking at updates, responding to security incidents. We've had uh, one critical and like three sev like high security incidents on the Cosmos mainnet that have propagated all the other Tendermint chains. So we have to do upgrades, um, monitoring, all the stuff, all the software around sort of DevOps and monitoring is all really immature. Uh, we've had to write a lot ourselves. Um, a lot of what we've been open sourcing and contributing back, but like these are all like sort of big sources of cost in order to build, you know, these things. And, you know, I fundamentally a deep believer in the proof of space thesis. I'm a big believer in like these node operators. I'm a big believer in having sort of um, projects, uh, companies that sit between many projects and contribute to a lot of them. And so like occlusion is very much my bet on that thesis, um, but it is expensive and it, uh, it's a really difficult business um, right now. And we're all sort of hoping for a future where these networks caught custody even larger amounts of value and you know, a thing like occlusion can be successful. Uh, can uh, one of you give me numbers, like these dollars? So we spend about f uh, like three grand a month on like data center capacity mm. and probably about 10x that on salaries. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Okay. And for the, the node uh, operator, for example, in storage? Uh, yeah, I mean, so, so storage, again, our, our design center was, hey, you should be able to take existing hardware that you're running, you know, whether you're, you know, your apartment is in London or in Lagos and, and be able to do so with almost no incremental cost. Mm -hmm. So at this point, actually, the incremental cost to run uh, a storage node, if you already have a, a disk drive and a connection to the internet, is measured in pennies per month. Mm -hmm. But that's meant we've made some really important design decisions around what we ask people to do. And other than an initial proof of work to prove so that you just can't spin up these things easily, right? Um, ongoing basis, it really, there's the only cryptographically mildly expensive thing to do is to validate that you you have the data that you say, and we make it as cheap as possible, right? It's easy to, it costs you almost nothing if you're storing the data you say you're storing, um, and it costs you a lot if you're trying to cheat. And then otherwise, it doesn't take any more electricity to run a a disk drive at 75% capacity than at 25% capacity. So. So, so I have a question about yeah. uh, regulation. Uh, we're we're going to wrap up uh, real soon, but um, uh, there is the security uh, law and, um, and you know, so there's uh, in income tax. Um, do you guys uh, deal with that? Is, that? is that a problem with giving out uh, tokens of, of your projects to uh, nodes and um, how do you tackle that? Your legal team, are they like uh, yes, closing a lot of their eyes? And a, a lot of legal bills, yes. Okay. Follow all the regulations. Absolutely. Consider the sec before mainnet, consider the security. And uh, yeah, do all the paperwork that needs to be done. Pay a lot of legal bills. Sad. No, but, but I mean, I think, I think it is a, actually a competitive differentiator. And one of the things I think of everybody on this panel is that we've actually been spending our time building things rather than, uh, <laughs> you know. You look at, look at the 2017 crop of, I, of, uh, of ICOs and I think a, a high percentage of the people who've actually built and are launching things are on this panel. But, um, you know, spend your time building great stuff and uh, yeah, invest in governance and try and be leading in governance as well as in, uh, as in code. All right. Uh, so, uh, thank you, everybody. Uh, is there a question from the crowd before uh, we clap? <laughs> All right, clap. <laughs>